Tonight I set aside some time to do a BIOS upgrade on my Supermicro Super Server. I'm at BIOS 1.2c, which was the release that came out in September last year. Now we're up to 1.3 that came out recently, specifically with Spectre mitigation in mind. And let's start by downloading it. So you can find your motherboard on this site and then download the file. Or you can click here, you still have to sign a license agreement or you have to agree to the uh, terms there. Click accept. I'm going to save it into this snazzy new super micro folder. There's the file name, 213 it ends in. And now we have the file. Going back a little bit, just double check. Yep, file name 213. Cool. Now what I tend to do is I open up, I say show in folder. I'm going to go ahead and extract it because we're going to need the file that's inside of it to do the upgrade. And there it is. Now the readme talks about stuff like making a BIOS, a dospitable device with the BIOS files on there. Yeah, you can do that. I'm going to do an easier way tonight though, because I'm making a minor hop in the BIOS and I'm going to preserve all my settings and do an upgrade through IPMI. So let me set us up for that. And uh, actually I'm kind of done with this. All right, so IPMI, here we go. And you'll see why I'm showing power consumption and a, and a power switch over there in the, on the left. You can see that a little later. All right, so getting into the IPMI interface will let us, first of all, see what the server is doing. Okay, it's booted, powered on. And BIOS version 1.2c, fine. Now I do want to gracefully shut down and I also want you to see what's going on when I do that. So how about I bring up the remote control HTML5 interface here. And that'll prevent me from having to go through that Java pop-out stuff. Okay, and then to crank up the uh, quality here of the video, it already is, good. So yeah, that's just your usual ESXi stuff. Now, I'll also point out with something called vSphere host client, that's pointing your browser uh, right to the server. You can also see the BIOS version there if you're running ESXi on your Xeon D system. There it is, 1.2c. It even shows the type of CPU right here. All right, so I am ready to shut down. There's no VMs that are uh, critical to me on there, and it's now gracefully shutting down. What this also means is that back on the browser interface, whoa, <laughs> I went a little too far with the uh, shutdown there. Uh, back in the interface, where I was showing you uh, IPMI, there we go. That's the one I was looking for. Uh, you're gonna see shutting down as ESXi goes down and now it's halted. Cool, that window's not doing a whole lot anymore. I'll close that and bring up IPMI again. And if we go back to the system screen here, you'll see host is currently off, cool. Now you don't have to do this. You can do a BIOS upgrade with it on, but it's still gonna have to be shut off at some point anyway to take effect, so uh, next piece. I'm actually normally ready to go into maintenance and go into BIOS upgrade mode, but first, I really wanna have a quick tour of the BIOS. So for the purposes of this video, kind of an archive, I wanna see all the BIOS features and submenus just to see if anything changes when we move from 1.2c to 1.3. So I'm gonna fire up remote control again. All right, so when this thing comes up, we need to hit the not we, I need to hit the delete key. And I'm gonna get into the BIOS at that point to show you all the settings, whip right through them. I don't think any of them have changed. I've done one rehearsal on a 12 core system, a ZND 1567. This is my second BIOS upgrade using this simple method and it went quite well the first time, which is why I'm recording on the eight core, which is a much more common system that people have out there. But really all the ZNDs, uh, they share the same BIOS 1.3 level now. It is a different download for the Flex ATX bigger motherboards than the mini ITX based system we're looking at here. Okay, now we're getting towards the end of the BIOS or power on self test, excuse me. And I hit delete key on time and it says entering setup. And now we'll get a quick tour of the BIOS together. Let me get that cursor out of the way and go through all the menus real fast. Stand by while I do that.
Okay, I'm gonna discard changes and exit. Sure, why not? Doesn't really matter because I'm about to power the system off. So early in the hypervisor boot process, like real early like this, certainly not a big deal to basically, uh, kind of like yanking the power cord, I'm doing a soft shutdown of the system. I haven't actually de-energized the motherboard, but we're good, all set, ready to roll. So heading over to maintenance as promised and doing BIOS update. Now, I have an article that talks about how you get the license key uh, for this to initially activate it. If you've already done that, great. You're good for the life of this serial number, this system. And you'll be able to do easy BIOS updates through the IPMI interface, through this web interface from there on in. Uh, but if you haven't gone through that step, you might have to wait a little bit for a um, activation from Supermicro, or you can buy it. Um, but anyhow, the directions are all uh, there in my uh, BIOS upgrade articles, one of the older ones. Okay, I'm gonna bring that up. There it is. So right here you can get it, uh, the Super Micro Update Manager, um, with a trial license key. Okay, so there's your information on all of that. All right, let's continue. Choosing the file. So do you remember we still had this folder open? So instead of poking my way around or hunting for it, I can actually just copy the path right now. There we go. Choose the file. I can literally just paste the path right up here and hit enter, but it wasn't exactly hard. It was in a subfolder where I was anyway. Now here's the important spot. 213, that's the bias file. You wanna make sure you get the right one and you wanna double check you're on the right type of system and all of that. Uh, if you do try to, try to do the flash sorry, the Flex ATX motherboard BIOS for the mini ITX motherboard I'm on, it'll warn you and tell you it won't even let you proceed. All right, so here you go, upgrade the BIOS. Now, there's not much to watch here, um, but this is simpler than creating DOS bootable media, sticking the server, booting off of that temporarily, maybe even turning off UEFI in the BIOS so that booting from uh, USB drives works. It's the legacy devices like DOS bootable media need that. That's kind of a hassle, it takes a little time. And in my case today, what we're gonna see instead is it's uploading the biased image right now. If we have a look at the ethernet, we might even still see that. Nah, it looks like it's probably already sent. Anyhow, once the bias up update is there, we should get prompted for another menu. Now the bottom left it says waiting for, right? The next sub menu is, do we wanna preserve stuff? So by default, it's preserving the SMBIOS settings. So everything you saw there was according to these settings. This was written quite a while ago and nothing significant has really changed in there. So I have all my settings documented. Uh, if you are told by tech support for whatever reason to clear SMBIOS, which is sometimes uh, seen out there in various articles, then by all means do so and just get your BIOS settings back again. But today, I like to uh, tinker or try many different ways of doing the same kind of thing. And um, let's, get, let's get moving on this. So the way I'm doing now is my second, hopefully successful uh, run at preserving the bias settings. Now this is a little weird that existing data is blank. Last time I did this, uh, I believe it showed uh, 1.2c. So a little bit odd, but time to start the upgrade. So here's where it's actually doing the firmware flashing. It takes a while, as I mentioned, and we need to just be patient while it does its thing. One thing I've noticed, if you have like a local VGA cable attached to it, um, when you first power on the machine after a BIOS update, if you went back to factory defaults, it'll reboot twice. I think it powers on and then just kind of powers itself off after a minute and you kind of think something's wrong, but nope, that's just the BIOS taking effect. But what I've been told, Numerous times by people in Supermicro support um, is that you're supposed to yank the port power cord out after updating the BIOS or after updating IPMI. 
So if you have that luxury, uh, sure, go for it. Although I'll admit, I've seen success for this minor hop, 1-2-C, up to 1.3, without pulling out the power cord. It seemed to work fine. Uh, I don't want to encourage that behavior, and that's why in this video I'm going to do the right thing and actually take out the power cord after this BIOS upgrade step through the web interface is done. You'll notice it still says loading the upper right. We just need to wait for it to finish and not do anything. I would not recommend resizing it. I would certainly recommend doing this over a wired connection and with a UPS battery power source for your server to make sure you don't lose power inadvertently in the middle of a BIOS upgrade like this. That would tend to be a bad thing. There are BIOS recovery procedures. If you have a brick-like server that won't boot up, I would encourage you to call the Supermicro 24-7 hotline for support in that kind of circumstance. All right, loading went away in the upper right. Bottom left of my browser says waiting for the web server. So it seems like it's probably about to time out or the web session will die. It's likely the process is done. We just don't quite see it yet. So I'm going to wait a little longer for something to happen before I try moving around the web UI and see if um, we're good to go. So you remember what I said? There you go. So broke. Cool. Expected. As it's restarting. So do you remember back here and the ability to turn off the server? So 11 watts at idle, or sorry, not idle, powered off. So the IPMI is using some watts there. Okay, the server's now off. That will certainly kill the web UI or anything from working. And you tend to want to leave at about 15 seconds, depends on the different tech support person I've talked to at Supermicro, what you're told. But anyhow, we've de-energized the motherboard for a bit. I power it back on. And now we get to wait for probably a solid minute while the server has power again, going to 11 watts waiting for that server to finish initializing. Now, I'm just waiting for IPMI to initialize. The server itself is not powered on. That setting is not set on my server to auto power on when you plug the power cord back in. I'll just point that out. All right, so at some point, probably about a minute after boot, uh, you'll have a responsive user interface through the web UI. But for now, it's way too early in the boot to see anything happen here. And now that we've had power for almost a minute, the pinwheel at the top of this Chrome session should resume and I should get prompted for your username and password to work my way back into the web interface. Once we get there, I'm gonna power on the system, but I'm gonna also wanna have a look at the VGA output, the video output of the server as it comes up in case something kind of interesting happens. Doesn't look too happy with this window. It's taking uh, longer than I think, so I think I'm just going to be fine with closing it and starting it again. I'll bet I'll get prompted for the password right away this time. Okay. Server is off. Powering it on over on the left, you'll see the watts will change, of course, naturally, as it powers on. And the power on self-test uses a little bit of extra power. Uh, in fact, the fans kind of spin up and speed up at one point. So you'll see a little more, bit of an elevated watt uh, burn during the initial boot process that you won't necessarily see once an OS is initialized, booted, and settled down. So as we wait for this screen to finish, I want to point out my article that talks a little bit about the recommended settings and why they are the way they are in servers that ship from Wired Zone, the bundles. So UEFI is best for modern OSs. It simplifies the boot menu. You can have 
bigger than two terabyte drives you can boot from. You can boot from NVMe devices. There's all sorts of modern goodness to having UEFI be your bias type. Okay, and right here, dual to UEFI. So the rest of this stuff is cosmetic mostly. Um, there's this thing called bifurcation. And if you're using your PCIe slot for a card that has like four M.2 cards on there, like the Asus uh, Hyper um, M2 device, uh, it gets you four NVMe devices. Yeah, you might have to change the setting. And this article tries to explain all that. But really, it's mostly about numlock, staying off when powered. And then finally, um, if you have a uh, VGA card in there, you'd use external. And then finally, UEFI mode. So that's about it. Now the machine came up. Ooh, it's behind me. It's too busy talking. Now you might have seen that in the background a little bit. But we got ESXi coming back up. Uh, what happened with the BIOS? Well, unfortunately, I missed recording the screenshot. And I'd actually like to just let it boot, I guess, at this point. Because remember, the ESXi interface lets us see the BIOS from there. Once ESXi is done coming up cleanly, since we're well into the boot process at this point, I'll go ahead and shut down again and then show you around the BIOS and do that inventory of how uh, things look as far as BIOS menus. In other words, did anything change before and after this new BIOS upgrade that probably completed at this point? Now we can check with IPMI. So head on over to System. And I'm going to hit Refresh. Uh-huh. 1.2c still shows. So that's interesting. It seems the bias upgrade didn't stick, or yeah, we just don't know. All right, well, the server's back up. It's a little blurry because the uh, video preferences were not held on to since it was re-power cycled. Anyhow. Let's have a look at the HTML5 interface, the vSphere client. This is me pointing my browser, a shortcut, straight to the SXI host to see if the BIOS still shows 1.2c. It does. So we've now witnessed a failure where powering off or unplugging the power cord after installing the BIOS was a bad move if the server is powered on, perhaps. So at this point, I think it's safe to say I'd want to alter my procedure. Um, this hasn't happened before to me, to my recollection. And let's see. This thing shutting down. Yeah, here we go. System's been halted. Video display is gone. I'll close that and I'll bring up IPMI again. Hitting refresh here should so show the server off. And just for grins, we'll power it on uh, one more time, just in case BIOS 1.3 shows up on that second boot. And I probably should have just left remote control open there. Sorry about that. All right, so as we get near the end of the power on self-test, I need to be ready to hit the delete key so that I can get into the BIOS and confirm what level it says right in the BIOS screen from the Supermicro server. That will be interesting um, to see what's going on there. So I am definitely uh, disappointed. I didn't record video the first time around of it probably coming up and booting right into SXI. What I had been expecting is for it to take much longer and end up with the power off after powering it on. So the behavior after power cycling or DNN drives in the motherboard is definitely different than the first update I did on the 12 core, where I simply did an upgrade, uh, rebooted, and I was done. So, getting ready on the delete key. Bias 1.2c. Pretty much seen enough already. And the machine did stay. Oh, it's going right to the hypervisor. All right. All right, going to do this over again. So this is ending up being a kind of tinkering video, not so much a streamlined, uh, svelte, <laughs> lightweight and short and to the point video, but that's okay. Um, the only segment you'll need to see is this next bias upgrade that's going to be a successful one. 
I'm hoping. So I'm going to leave remote control up this time. Be less likely to mess up. And I'm going to get rid of the idea of power cycling the motherboard. And I'm going to start over from scratch, basically, and say, OK, here's the main screen. Here's our remote control. And here we are, ready to uh, power off the machine if it's not already. Gracefully shut down whatever you were doing. Select BIOS update. It goes into BIOS update mode. Choose your file that's in the zip file I downloaded, unzipped, and found the file within called .213. Click open. And click update BIOS and wait. So we already know what happens here. It uploads the file, which uh, doesn't take very long. It's already 76% done. The Ethernet shows a brief spike, and now it's already settling down. As it's done transferring the file, that's fine. And now we've got the pop-up screen pretty fast this time, and things are looking better. OK? So the first time, for some reason, we didn't see the existing date this time we do. Okay, and it also killed off my KV IKVM, which makes sense. All right, so there was something a little bit wonky that first time. It was a bad sign that we didn't see existing date. I should have thought more about that or maybe disconnected power at that point and tried again, but I didn't. And this video is now an archive of some slight weirdness that happened on 1.2c. Anyhow, we're moving off of it, and maybe that bug I might have just unearthed goes away. Who knows? Next piece, since I'm starting over, is I'm keeping the SM BIOS. I wanted to um, save myself a little bit of time uh, by going with the factory upgrade where when people don't read the manual, this is what they're going to do. They're not going to tend to clear this checkbox. Okay. Now, in weird circumstances, if they're troubleshooting, Supermicro Support will have you clear all three checkboxes saying you should discard everything in your system. But in my case, I'm going to try the, for my second successful time, hopefully, uh, doing this. Uh, 12 core a few days ago, and then the 8 core tonight. I'm going to try doing a BIOS upgrade that doesn't lose any of my BIOS settings. In other words, the whole process is download the file and unzip it, point to it with the BIOS upgrade utility you just saw me do, wait a little bit, and reboot and you're done. So that's about as simple as it gets for a BIOS update. All through a web UI, no messing with boot media and no messing with boot order or temporary boot devices or creating boot media. So that's pretty slick uh, if it works. So now I know to add to my directions, make sure it shows the old version as well as the new version before you consider proceeding. I like that we're getting a nice status bar here. And I'm going to go ahead and move the mouse out of the way. And I'll speed up this segment of video.
All right, this is going better. Uh, we're getting a prompt about powering on the system. So this is the way it should have worked. It's been so many months since I did it, or even watched one of my own videos, I kind of forgot it's this slick. So this is how you'd expect it. And a uh, progress bar, reassuring, and an OK button to say, let's power on the system for this to actually take effect. OK, we'll power on immediately, it's telling me. That's cool. Now this window is dead, so let's get remote control going quickly. Would be nice. No Java pop-ups, it's pretty quick. Cool, it's powered on. And going over to system here, we should see BIOS version somewhere, 1.3, nice. So that's how it's supposed to look. Well, this video ended up being much longer and messier than I would have expected, but, um, and I'll probably never get to the root cause of why it didn't show the old version and why it kind of went through motions without completing a BIOS upgrade without com failing in any obvious way, just the web UI kind of uh, croaking. So it was weird. Um, the right person uh, watching that video with their eyeballs would probably have a sense of what went wrong there. So again, I'm tempted to just kind of leave it. And what I'll do is I'll point to a chapter. I'll, in my article, I'll just have the video play back from however many minutes in when things are working correctly. Not much point in watching the first part, um, really, if you're just trying to see how you do a BIOS update with this method. Um, so the machine's going to boot up. I'm going to let it boot up normally, or am I going to go in and do an inventory of the settings? Well, I really wanted to let it finish booting normally uh, without touching anything, and you see what just happened. So you don't generally want to mess with the power buttons or anything. You want to let it do its thing. It just did what I expected, and that is a double reboot. All right, so that's a good thing. That's what it's supposed to be doing. So now in the second boot, I'm confident that everything's normal. Uh, in all my experience, having done many of these and worked with over a dozen uh, Xeon D systems, um, this is how they act. <laughs> the second boot, you're good to go, especially since IPMI confirms over on the left we're at BIOS 1.3, and we're going to see that in the splash screen. So I'm very comfortable at this point continuing with my BIOS inventory screen where I whip through, while recording video, every single menu and submenu of the BIOS configuration to make sure I see and am able to answer when people ask me, hey, do I see, uh, were there any changes in the BIOS? Visually, and features and whatever. So I need to pay attention now and hit delete key at the right moment to get in. Uh, this is interesting. I'm on a super micro splash screen. Hmm. I think this system went back to factory defaults, but I didn't tell it to clear my SM BIOS settings, so I'm a little surprised. So maybe that's why the README tells you to make a DOS bootable media, because maybe the web UI just isn't quite there yet as far as reliability, and yeah, I've seen the, super, the hypervisor. I've seen that too, where it's a little less uh, responsive over the HTML5 interface as far as trying to get into the BIOS setup. The Java uh, one, that tends to annoy people more, is a little more reliable as far as passing through that delete key that you hit during the boot. Uh, it's just the way it is. <laughs> um, that bug and that issue I've already documented and shown at other times. Okay, it looks like um, I got bumped out of IPMI. And hopefully I'll be able to bring up Java quickly enough to actually get in the bias without having to reboot yet again. That would be nice, wouldn't it? All right. I think I'm going to get there just in the nick of time. Yes, entering setup, it said. All right. Excellent. After cranking up, okay, it is cranked up. 
After making sure the video is good, I'm ready to go through the menus and submenus. You may just want to speed this part up, skip past it, whatever. I may even speed up the video because basically people are going to freeze on the right screen they want to look at. Okay, so clearly I'm back at factory defaults. So now it's time to follow my own article about the bias settings that are recommended that I use with success for quite some time now. So here we go. I'm ready at factory defaults, so I'm jumping in right here at step uh, five. I'm using bifurcation because I have that hyper M2 device in there. Whoops. Four by four by four by four is what I want. If you're not using anything in the PCI slot that doesn't pertain to or matter. And then finally, um, that's about it. Going into the UFI setting now. Let's go ahead and change the first boot device to uh, the sand disk. Now that's not going to work quite right necessarily because we're not in UEFI mode. So it'll actually show up differently on the next reboot. So it may or may not try to boot off the correct device, uh, which in my case is the 32 gig USB key with ESXi loaded on it. Uh, we'll know soon enough. So that kind of draws this to a close. What are the lessons I learned? Uh, <laughs> that it's a little more of an art instead of a science at this point. I can't really think of uh, why I lost all my settings. Um, had I de-energized the motherboard and just unplugged it um, and then powered, let's see, and just plugged it in and then did a upgrade while the machine was still off, I don't know. I really can't see why one system uh, lost the bias settings and the other one was able to maintain them. But uh, at this point, I pretty much covered all my bases as far as everything that could happen during a BIOS update. And um, hopefully this video ends up being useful to someone because of it. It's the kind of thing where if someone asks me a question or a comment on my site, I can point them to the right spot in the video and ask them to just watch that and kind of answer the question that way. So I'm not going to hit any keys. If it boots off of USB, I'm good to go, and I don't, I'm don't. i all done and letting ESXi come on up. If it tries to boot off of something else and hangs, well, then I know I still have some work to do.
Okay, preferred OS is booting. I can already see because it resized to the right resolution. All right, so now I wait for ESXi to come up and the BIOS version should show there as well. I don't have to stare at this screen. I don't want to. I can also show you vSphere client. So vSphere client, a richer UI pointing to the vCSA appliance. That also lets me uh, look around, but it's a different sort of view and the host is not actually online yet. So since everyone has the host client, meaning they point, can point their browser straight to the ESXi host, like the shortcut I have here, that's a good way for you to um, very quickly see if your operating system is also seeing the new bias level that you just laid down in the system. So this system was installed with the UEFI initially active and still active, and that lets me turn on things like secure boot later without having to reinstall ESXi. Same thing with kind of Windows. If you have a GPT partition and it's three terabytes in size you boot from, great. If you turn on UEFI, that thing won't be bootable, right? So all good stuff to keep in mind if you're not too familiar with all that quite yet. All right, so soon ESXi will be done. I'll be able to log in. And finally, <laughs> uh, just finish this video, which is, again, way longer than I thought it was going to be. The final uh, edit will probably be in around half an hour or something. Okay. That's done. It's booted. Pointing ESXi host client to that ESXi host that we just booted should very quickly let us see the summary screen where we can then see the bias. A little bit of a slowdown because it had just booted. All right, 1.3. So there we go, bias version 1.3 and ZND 1541. Yeah, you're wondering about the serial number. That stuff can be set with a IPMI uh, tool. I've um, actually had mixed success with that, but anyhow, that's for another day. The BIOS upgrade is done. Spectre Type 2 mitigation is now behind me from a BIOS level, uh, but you also want to make sure you have the latest patch level, and I want to point out to people, if you haven't found that article or articles that talk about this, here they are. Kind of hard to miss right in the top of my homepage uh, right now. You want to do your VCSA first, bolded, this article. Then your ESXi server next, bolded, this article. Each VM's operating system. And then finally your BIOS. So your ESXi version should show build 796.7591 for you to be completely done with mitigation. Uh, <laughs> for now anyway, uh, I'll point out there's another, whoops. Let me go back up. Sorry, making you dizzy. There's the article you want to see for the latest from various software and hardware vendors about what's all happening in this world. But yeah, hopefully, finally, now in almost April 1st, I'm kind of done with this whole meltdown specter thing, um, documenting all those steps for remediation. That was definitely uh, on the painful side as far as <laughs> what people have to go through. Basically patching everything. So... Hopefully you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching and thanks for visiting. Tinker try. IT at home. Good night.